Here's what Paul says. He says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Okay? The first covenant was faulty in perfection. All right? It was faulty in perfection. Notice again. If the first covenant had been faultless, then there should have no place been sought for the second. If something is broke, you don't fix it unless you work for the government. Then the government, if, if it's broke, you fix it. If it's, if it doesn't, if it's not broken, you, you fix it until it is. Well, in the case of, of the Old and New Testament, the first could not do what needed to be done. It was not perfect in the sense of it was not complete. Otherwise, God would have left it in place. Now, Hebrews 7 and verse 11, Hebrews 7 verse 11, he's going to tell us that, yes, there was a, a change. There was a change. Now, you might be saying, well, James, I don't, I don't know that anyone would, would uh, um, uh, disagree that the old and new ha are, are, has changed, that the old took the place of the new. Well, let's look what the Bible says here for a second. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that none that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? All right? If it was perfection, if the perfection was under the, the old priesthood, why have another one? All right? Why have another one? Now, when we make these points, oftentimes people don't believe that the law changed. They want to think that the Old and New Testament are existing together and you can go back and get what you want out of the old and get what you want out of the new. Well, that's a problem. And when you, pull, when you point this out, oftentimes people have difficulty with it and don't want to believe that the law has actually changed. Let's uh, get a little blast from the past here and go back and let's uh, listen to what a caller says on this very point. Notice this. All right. type of worship and does not condemn Sorry. it in the New Testament, just like uh, in the Old Testament, the law was now n of none effect. Now Sorry. we have Jesus as our high priest. And I'm not worshiping because it's a law thing or concerning the law, because it's not concerning the law. Sir, if anything, the whole point, if any, if the whole reason why Jesus, given, and let me ask you this the whole question. reason why Jesus can how be high you, priest, you, the whole reason why Jesus can be high priest is because the law changed. The law that dealt with the and sacrifices sir, the and dealt with, changed. sir, the law was fulfilled. The, the law I'm, was fulfilled. If you say the, the law changed, then you're a liar. Okay, or, the right sir, listen, you call me a liar because you said that I said something wasn't about I want to read it to you. And I put you on hold so that you'll listen. <clears throat> you said I was a liar when I said the law changed. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 11, For the priesthood being changed, there is also made of a necessity a change also of the law. The reason why Jesus can be a high priest and not be after the order of Aaron or under the Levitical priesthood was because the law changed. Now, the law changed. Now, I'm not a liar, sir. You do error not knowing the scriptures. All right. So now here he is. The gentleman called me a liar when I said the law changed. But, friends, that's what the Bible clearly teaches. In Hebrews chapter uh, 7 and verse uh, uh, 12, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Now, the law changed. Now, the reason why it changed was because it was not perfect. It was not uh, perfect. It, was, it had them faults to it. In Romans chapter 7, excuse me, Romans 7 and verse 12, notice again. Romans 7, verse 12, Paul said, ah. All right, we're going to get there. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that's the law, 
that the sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So the law was good. It served its purpose, but it was not perfect in the sense of it couldn't do what man needed. So it needed to be replaced. It was faulty. And that is why it's old and ready to decay, is what Paul's saying. The Old Testament that was given at Mount Sinai, represented by the Ten Commandments, could not do what the New Testament could do. And that's why it needed to be replaced. It's old and decaying, okay? Now let's look again. The first covenant was faulty in performance. Now I'm going to go through some of these points here, then we're going to make the application. Now notice, it was faulty in performance. Hebrews 8 and verse 8. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them out by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant and regarded them not, saith the Lord. And I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So, it's not the same kind of covenant. It's not it's going to be like the old covenant. So it was faulty in performance. Why? Why was it faulty in performance? It was faulty in performance in the sense of it was hard to keep. The Old Testament was a very difficult thing to keep. Notice this. In Acts 15, Acts 15 and verse 7, look what Peter's going to say. Now Peter is... Uh, they're having this big discussion in uh, Jerusalem. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how the good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now watch it, verse 10. Now, where, now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Now the yoke that Peter's talking about is the yoke of the Old Testament, the, the law of Moses. He says, why do you want to put that law on them? Why do you want to put the, the yoke of circumcision, the necessity of circumcision on them when we ourselves couldn't keep this law that said you must be circumcised. The whole thing the Jews were saying was that you had to become a Jew first in order to become a Christian. Peter says, no. Why do you want to put that yoke on them? We couldn't even bear it. Why, why burden them with that? Now, compare the Old Testament, the yoke that Peter says is hard to bear, to the New. In Matthew 11, verse 28, look what Jesus says. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly and hearty, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The old, the yoke of the Old Testament was heavy. It was a burden. It was something that was very difficult. This system of learning, this system of, of instruction was difficult. Jesus says, my yoke is easy. Take my yoke, learn of me. It's easy, it's light. But the yoke of the Old Testament was heavy. All right? It wasn't a good performance. You couldn't, you couldn't do much to it. So it was, a, it was a faulty, it was ready to decay and be taken away because it couldn't perform right. It was a, a very difficult system to live under. Notice this. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, again, this is what Paul says. He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, friends, if the Old Testament was so great, why did God say, let's take it away? If it was so superior, so wonderful, why was it a necessity that it should be removed? And why did Paul say then it's, ready, it's old, it's waxing gold, it's ready to decay, and ready to vanish away? I'll tell you why, because it wasn't a good performance. It was not performing like the new one could. You know why, you know why people are are uh, not driving the old muscle cars with the big uh, 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 motors in them anymore, and instead they want something that is more fuel efficient? Because these individuals, these cars, 
or you get better gas performance, you might say. Now, if you want to pull something, then you need a big, you need a big strong vehicle. It will perform better than a little, than a little uh, uh, hybrid plug-in car. But depending on what you're using it for, one is going to perform better than the other. The new covenant is going to perform better than the old covenant. Why? Because it is new and improved, you might say. It is better at doing what God needed. So Christ said, I'm going to bring about a new covenant. Matthew 26, 28. Matthew 26 and verse 28. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. All right? So the old covenant is, is a, a, a poor performer, faulty in performance, faulty in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in able to do what needed to be done. So God said, I'm not going to make a covenant like that, one that, th that they couldn't keep, one that was so difficult, one that was so hard. He said, I'm not going to do that. It served its purpose. I'm going to make another one, a better one. That's why the old law is, better, is ready to uh, be old. Now notice this. It was faulty in participation. The reason why the Hebrew writer said that the old covenant is ready to wax old and vanish away is because it was faulty in participation. Now look at this. In Hebrews 8 and verse 11, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor. And every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Now, here's something we need to understand. Under the old covenant, if you were born, if you were born into the, uh, uh, the Jewish system, you were circumcised on the eighth day. If you were a male, you were circumcised on the eighth day. And as you got older, then they took you and said, Now, this is why you're a Jew. And they taught you. God said, you know what? They're not going to do that anymore. Under the new covenant, they're not going to teach every man his neighbor saying, know the Lord. Because under the new covenant, under the new covenant, you know the Lord before you enter into a covenant with God. See so that? You're taught and then you say, I know the Lord. Not the other way around. Not you come into it now let's learn the system. Now, let me just say this. Notice, well, let me just make this point. In Ezra 7, verse 25. Ezra 7, verse 25. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. Now, they had to teach people who were already Jews, who knew the law, who didn't know the law, but yet they were Jews. Now, that's not the way in the New Covenant. In the New Covenant, you don't become a Christian and then say, all right, now let me find out what I've gotten myself into. Oh, no. That's not the way it works. The Christian knows, is taught, and learns, and then becomes a Christian. All right? You, if you are a Christian, you were taught of God, and then you became a Christian. Not the other way around. See the difference? So the old covenant was faulty in participation. You had people, it had people in the covenant that didn't understand or know the laws or didn't, uh, didn't uh, uh, keep the laws because they'd just been brought up in it. And it was just like habit with them. It wasn't a commitment. Let me tell you this. We've got some people who say, well, I'm going to baptize little kids. Let me tell you, I'm not going to baptize a kid. Because there's a commitment level issue. There's a commitment issue there. A child may know what the Bible says to do to be saved. But that doesn't mean that they need to obey that. It doesn't mean that they're accountable. It just means that they've been taught it. But as far as the commitment level, they haven't made a commitment to the Lord. They haven't made a commitment to the Lord. All they've done is... They've just made a commitment to mom and daddy's religion. This is what mom and daddy done. That's what I'm going to do. Oh, no. No. That, that young boy, that young girl, they have to make the commitment. They have to make, be old enough to make the decision to say, I know who God is, and I know that I'm going to serve him. I'm not going to serve him. 
Now, they have to make that choice. And I say that's the reason why in, uh, in a lot of the, the churches of Christ, that's why you have some young people growing up, and then when they get out of the house, they, they leave and they go. gone. Why? Because they weren't grounded in convict, uh, personal conviction. It was something, well, I just always went to church that way. Oh, no, the Bible, that's why the Bible says that men and women obeyed the gospel. Men and women, notice this, in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, just for example, just hit on this and we'll move on. Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. And when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, no children, men and women. When Paul went about to uh, persecute the church, notice this, in Acts chapter 9, in Acts chapter 9, uh, about verse 2, come on down here to it, and Saul yet breathed out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus of the synagogue that he found any of this way, whether they were men or women or children. No, nope, no children. He might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Men and women. Men and women. Well, that's the difference. The first covenant was faulty in participation in that you had boys and girls when they were babies. They were Jews. They were Jews. And then they had to grow up and be taught. Well, this is, this is what it means to be a Jew. Now look at this. Here's another example. In 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 3, in verse 1, ah, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There, there was no open vision. Verse 2, And it came to pass that at a time when Eli lay down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim, that he, excuse me, that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. That the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here am I. Now he ran to Eli. Now he does this several times. The Lord calls Samuel, and Samuel doesn't know who it is. He thinks it's Eli. Finally, uh, Samuel perceived that uh, Samuel, uh, excuse me, Eli realized that it was God talking to Samuel. Now notice this, verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. But here he'd been serving in the temple with Eli all this time. He was a Jew. He was circumcised on the eighth day, but yet he didn't know the Lord. Now, do you think he knew what the law said? Yep. But he didn't know the Lord. So in the new covenant, in the new covenant, it wasn't going to be that way. In the new covenant, you're going to be taught. In the new covenant, you're going to be taught. And then you enter into a relationship, Okay. So, that, the first covenant is ready to be taken away. It's old. It's decaying. Why? Because it's not, uh, it was faulty in participation. Now, it's faulty in the promise, too. Hebrews 8, 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, here's the problem. The first covenant was faulty in the promise that your sins will be forgiven. The old covenant couldn't promise that. Couldn't promise that. God says in a new covenant, I'm going to bring about a new covenant and I'm going to remove their sins and iniquities. I'm not going to remember them anymore. Now the old covenant couldn't do that. Jeremiah 33 verse 8. Jeremiah 33 8. God says through Jeremiah, and I will cleanse them from their, all their iniquity whereby they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have transgressed against me. Of the old covenant, they weren't forgiven. They weren't pardoned. All their sins were was rolled forward. That's all it was. Rolled forward, reminded. Notice this. In Hebrews, whoop, sorry about that.
Hebrews chapter 10. The law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of things can never with those sacrifices where they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Couldn't do it. Why? Because, verse 4, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. If it was possible, then once they offered, they would have ceased. They would have offered the sacrifice one time. Their sins would have been gone. They wouldn't have to do it again. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. The old covenant was not uh, uh, sufficient in fulfilling this promise that I'll remember their sins no more. That's why a new covenant had to come. In Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 13, verse 38, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. It wasn't until Christ came that you're able to be justified and have your sins forgiven, which you couldn't do by the law of Moses. Now, why do you want the law of Moses? It's no good. Not for this purpose, it's not. It's not good enough to forgive sins. That's why it's old, ready to decay, ready to vanish away. See that? It's ready to be gone. Romans 11, verse uh, 27. Romans 11, 27. Notice this. It says, for this is my covenant to them. I will take away their sins. I'll take away their sins. Now, if the old covenant could have done that, you wouldn't need a new one. But it couldn't. So, God says the old one's ready, it's, it's, it's decaying over here, ready to vanish away. It was faulty in promise. It could not forgive sins. And finally, it was final in perishing. You know why the old covenant was ready to vanish away? It was because it had served its purpose. Look at this, Hebrews 8, 13. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now friends, there's a reason why the Old Testament needed to die. Why it needed to be finished. Why it needed to be taken out of the way. Here's the principle. Look at this in John 12, 24. John 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now we understand this principle. Anybody who's planting the garden knows that if you take these seeds, you got some corn here, you take the seed corn and you just set it there, it's not going to do anything. But if you put it in the ground and you put some water on it, that seed dies, and the life that is within it brings forth the plant. But the seed dies. The seed dies. And so in order to bring something better to life, something else had to die. Something else had to die. So it is with the law. The old covenant had to die in order to bring about something better. Something new. So why are you trying to hold on to the old covenant when it, in reality there's something new that's out there growing? It had to die. There's no way the old could still remain intact and in, uh, uh, in force and a new law come into place too. They, they can't exist together. They cannot exist together in authority. And that's what I'm saying. Because they're contrary to one another. One is saying, do this. Another saying, no, this one's better. One is saying, well, here's a, here's a priesthood over here that has to offer sacrifice every, every year. And the other says, no, we have a high priest. He's offered a sacrifice one time. And so the Old Testament had to die. The Old Testament had to die. Now, here's my point. When you go back to the Old Testament to get your authority, you need to remember this. 
When you go back to the Old Testament to get your authority, what you're actually doing is you're getting, going back and getting something that is, uh, that is rotting. This is what you're going back to. You're going back to something that is decaying. It's rotting. If you use the Old Testament as your authority for religion, you've got rotting religion. That's what you have. You have rotting religion. You can't go back and get authority from the Old Testament without recognizing you're, you're getting rotting religion. Now, think about this. Think about this. When you, when you come... And you say, well, you know what? I'm going to go back. I'm going I'm to have an altar call. Show me an altar in the New Testament. Show me an altar in New Testament worship. Now, I know you can find the word altar in the New Testament. But show me an altar in New Testament worship. The altar was part of the Old Testament worship. Leviticus 1.17. And he shall cleave it with two wings thereof and shall not divide it asunder. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar. We're talking about a, a sacrifice here. Upon the wood that is upon the fire, it is a burnt sacrifice and an offering made by fire of a sweet savor to the Lord. Now, there's an altar. The Old Testament had the altar as part of the worship. Now, we have people today, well, we don't have sacrifices today. Jesus is our sacrifice, and he, he sacrificed everything for us, but we still got an altar call. What do you need an altar call for? Why do you need an altar? You don't have any sacrifices. So you don't have any sacrifices, but you still have the altar. Where did you get that? See, friends, you're getting that. That's, that's rotting religion. You, are, you are, are participating in rotting, decaying religion when you go back to the Old Testament and say, well, we're going to have us an altar. Now, I've been to places they have altar call. Everybody comes to the front and lays down on the floor or whatever. Where did you get an altar? You see, we're trying to do Bible things in Bible ways. Let's get back to New Testament authority. So when you go back for the altar call, friends, you're getting rotting religion. Rotting religion. What about this? What about the Catholic type priesthood? You ever think about that? Now, friends, think about this. The Catholic type priesthood is closer to the Old Testament system than the New Testament system. Notice this. In Exodus 40 and verse 15, Exodus 40, verse 15. And thou shalt anoint them as thou didst anoint their father, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office, for their anointing shall, be, shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Now, some people say, well, you know, it's an everlasting priesthood. Well, it was everlasting because they didn't know when it was going to end. God did. But since they didn't know, God said everlasting. But it did change. We already read this, Hebrews 7, verse 12. The law changed. You cannot have Jesus as your high priest if you are following a system that's more like the Old Testament. Show me in the New Testament, please, where the Catholic Church has the authority to have men who call themselves priests and take your confession in his little box? Show me in the New Testament where you have authority to say that the guy you call Papa, the Pope, that you call him the vicar of Christ on earth. Show me the authority. Show me where the Pope is Christ on earth. Show me that can't find it. You can't find it. So what you're doing is you're going back to the Old Testament to say, well, there needs to be a priesthood that, that has to be our mediator, our go-between. Listen, the, the New Covenant, the New Covenant provides, sorry about that, the New Covenant provides for the priesthood, but it's not like that kind of priesthood. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, notice this. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 
members of the Lord's church are the priests. Members of the Lord's church are priests. They're the ones who offer up sacrifices. You don't need someone to come around and do that and put a piece of cracker in your, in your mouth and give you a drink of grape juice. The new covenant has a priesthood, but it's not like the old covenant priesthood. The old covenant priesthood came from a certain tribe. I wonder if the Catholics have a certain tribe that all their priests come from. And I know, speaking of priesthood, I know in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, uh, I'm sorry about that, Hebrews 7, 5, that it's the Levites who served in the office of the priesthood. They're the ones who had a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is of their brethren. So, when people say, well, we got a priesthood today. That's why we need to tithe. Well, you had to prove that he's from the son, tribe of Levi. See, that, that priesthood ceased to exist. It was taken away. The old covenant did away with it. So if you want a priesthood, you want a priesthood today, why not go to the New Testament? 1 Peter 2, verse 5 and 1 Peter 2, verse 9. Notice again what, what Peter says. He says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, peculiar people that you should show forth the praise of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. We have a priesthood, but it's not like the Old Testament. Not like the Old Testament priesthood. All right? Now, you try to have a priesthood like this, you're getting some rotting religion. I mean, that's why that's a Catholic Church, that's rotten religion. That's rotten religion. Now, what about this? Mechanical instruments of music in worship. Someone said, well, David had the mechanical instruments of music. Yeah, he did. Look at this. First Chronicles 15, 16. I'll give you the Old Testament reference. First Chronicles 15, 16. David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers with instruments of music, psalteries, harps, cymbals, sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. David appointed, that's right, sure did. And it was, and it was, hey, it was, it was authorized by God. Second Chronicles 29, Second Chronicles uh, 29, verse 25. He set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with psalteries, with harps, according to the commandment of David and of Gad, the king's seer, and Nathan, the prophet. All right? And of Nathan, the prophet, for so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. All right? Verse 26. And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priest with the trumpets. And Hezekiah commanded the, to offer the burnt offering upon the altar, and when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets and with the instruments ordained by God, uh, uh, ordained by David. And all the congregation worshipped, and the singer sang, and the trumpet sound. And all this continued until the burnt offering was, uh, was finished. Verse 29, And when they had made an end of an offering, the king and all that were present with them bowed themselves and worshipped. Now, we said, well, they had, they, had old they had mechanical instruments of music in Old Testament worship. That's right. Under the rotten religion. The rotting religion, they sure had that. Why you want it today? You wouldn't eat it. Why you want to worship God with it? If it's rotting and decaying, friends, it's no good. It's no good. Now, I want to make this point too. Someone says, well, we're going to have we're going to have our singers and players and so forth. Well, notice, even in the Old Testament, even the singers and players had to be Levites. Now, do you have any Levites who are, doing, who are playing in the band? Going back to the old system is giving you rotting religion. You want a word from the Lord? Yes. Uh, is this James? Yes. 
Uh, hey, Jamie, it's, it's Rob from Cumming, Georgia. Hey, Rob. Um, uh, you speak on musical instruments, and I didn't know if you'd be interested. I, I went to the First Baptist Church over here in Cumming the other day and was just going in there wanting to speak with some gentlemen, you know, try to find some common ground between us and talk about our differences. And I heard this loud screaming noise coming from this room. And one of the rooms at their church building, and I walked in there. I walked by, I cracked the door open, and just took a peek. And they had guys in there. I, I bet they played a guitar solo for about, I, I don't know, six, ten minutes long. And not once did I hear anybody sing. And I've got every bit of it on video. And I didn't know if y'all be interested in me emailing it to you so you could. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that go ahead. Okay. That'd be fine. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. All right, and another point I'd like to make for the community, just to hear this, add another point. I walked in there and talked to one of their church administrators. Uh, before I spoke to the administrator, I should back up. I spoke to one of their members, and I asked them if they had, it was a Wednesday night, and they said, hey, are you guys having church service tonight? And the first impression she gave me, she didn't know. She, she had no idea if they were having any Bible study or worship or anything. She had to take me to her pastor uh, to... So let me ask him if they had a Wednesday night service. But anyway, I ended up talking to their one of their administrators about uh, a bunch of you know topics like baptism, et cetera. And towards the end of the conversation, he said uh, he asked him what my intent and purpose was for for coming and speaking to them. And I and I brought up First Corinthians ten where it says let there be no divisions. And so I told them that you know I'm trying to fight for the unity that Christ wants. And uh, he had mentioned in our in our talk that they don't allow anybody to, to become a member of that Baptist church if they haven't been immersed. They don't believe it's necessary for salvation. Uh, mm -hmm. And then so he's telling me to not be so judgmental about everybody else's doctrines, but yet they won't let some of the Methodists who go to their church become members because they haven't been fully immersed. And I asked him, I said, so do you think they're wrong? And he said, no, but they just couldn't become members because they haven't been immersed. <laughs> and so I asked him how couldn't, he couldn't just be courageous enough to come out and say that he thinks they're wrong, and that's why that he won't let, they won't let them become members. But he, they won't do it, and so I just want the community uh to hear or why not? Be, or why not? That really is. Or why not be courageous enough to come out and say that they're all right? If he right. thinks they're and all right, come on, said, come on out Johnny and say you're all right. Says, you should know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And if there's 1,200 plus denominations, they can't all be true. And so I asked him. I said, "Why are you Baptist?" And he said, "Well, I think we follow it the closest to the originals." And I just said, "But you just said that everybody else doesn't follow it as close to the originals as you do." Mm -hmm. And so therefore, they're wrong. He said, no, no, I didn't say that, but it's just all that double talking yeah. stuff yeah. going on. So I didn't know. I'm going to start sending you guys some videos, though, okay. there's a lot of silly people around here as well. Well, well here's, here's the thing, too, Rob, is this is uh, when he says that they have to be baptized to come into the Baptist church, but they're okay in the Methodist church. He's saying it's, right. it's easier to get to heaven than it is to get into the Baptist church. Yeah. You don't have to be baptized to get to heaven, according to him. According to him, you don't have to be baptized to get to heaven, but you do have to be baptized to get to the Baptist church. Of their particular congregation, you have to be immersed. And so I don't know what the point of that is. If it has nothing to do with being saved, I don't know why it doesn't matter. I don't even know why they have qualifications for being a member if right. nothing really matters. Right. The church doesn't matter, and it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter what church you're in. You know, doctrine's wrong. We can't judge anybody. But if you're going to be a member of the Baptist church, you're going to be baptized. Now, that's ridiculous. I think so, too, but yeah. I just wanted to call on that the community here. Not that I didn't know yeah. nothing you've never heard before. Right. But just so the community up there can hear what how I th silly that is. What I think, that's Rob, what, what, what this does is this actually helps our brethren, should help our brethren in other parts of the country who are watching this, to realize that, you know, denominational preachers are just as much a cowards everywhere else as they are up here. Right. And so, yeah. Oh, I, oh, yeah. you know, oh, I'd say you, you need so. to be going in, you need to be going and asking uh, these questions. And, and so I'd be amazed. Here's one of the other things I wanted to mention. Now, I've been a Christian for about a year and a half. I, prior to that, I had never cracked open a Bible. 
And the guy looked at me in the middle of our conversation and said, Sir, you have miraculous memory to remember these scriptures. And, and was just talking about how intelligent I was. And he'd have felt dumb if I had told him I'd only been a Christian a year. If he came to the church where I assembled, he'd have noticed that I was mm-hmm. the bottom percentile as far as knowledge goes. But just compared to people like him and, and, and churches like that, they don't spend any time uh, studying the scriptures. They've been Christians for 60 years, and I've been a Christian one year, and they think I'm just the most intelligent guy they've ever seen as far as Bible knowledge goes. Right. Right. And so I just thought that was, you know, well, it's, just, it's just little inconsistencies like yeah. that. You know, you would think if they had it going on, you wouldn't see all this double talking and, and people who've been Christian for 30 years who don't even know if they're having church service. Right, right. And can't even, well, can't even debate a one-year Bible student. Well, that's that's why, I mean, they, they don't put any emphasis on studying the Bible. I mean, that's, that's apparent. And that's why they don't want to answer your questions because they don't have enough Bible knowledge to answer those questions. So, well, I told him, well, I, I hope I didn't offend him, but if, you know, whatever. But I, I had a pamphlet in my pocket with my name and number and, and some some topics on there that I put on there. And uh, I said, sir, I'm not saying that you're not smart or anything, but I told him that if he, if he could just pass my information on to the most intelligent person that they have as far as Bible knowledge goes for them to call me. And yeah. so he's got my name and number. Well, and hopefully, I can get one to call well, I say me and keep, I can meet keep up, up with them and talk with them. Keep, as well. Well, but I, well, Rob, keep doing yeah, that. Hope, keep, listen, I'm coming up against the clock, so uh, yeah, uh, well, I appreciate you calling. Send that information on up to me. All right, we'll do. All right, bye. All right, all right. Now, so folks, here's what we're talking about here: that any time you go back to Old Testament authority, you're going back to a system that was designed to decay. So these things, like mechanical instruments of music and the altar calls, the altar and the, and the, the priesthood, that, that's all designed to decay. And so it is with, say, tithing. Now, there's another one. Everybody says, well, what about tithing? Malachi 3a, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, where have we, have we um, wherein have we uh, robbed you? Or uh, I don't know why... I've got a typo there. Uh, <clears throat> Malachi 3 8. Let me just pull it up here. Don't want anybody to think I misrepresented here. Here we go. Will a man rob God? Yet you have say, be say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, stop and think about this, friend. If tithing is something that you're going to Enforce today. That is to say that a person must give a 10%. You need to realize that the verse you're going to is actually talking about a nation tax. This is what it's for. You've robbed the whole nation. Now, when you tithe, or if you don't tithe, what nation are you robbing? What nation are you robbing? Let's, let's answer that question. What nation are you really robbing? See, friends, when you're going back to the old system, you're actually going back to a rotting religion. And that makes your religion rotting. You know what happens if you put a bad apple in a barrel of apples? All of them go bad. Because pretty soon that one rotten apple will ruin every one that it touches. And the ones that turn rotten because they touched it, they'll turn rotten. When you put something from the Old Testament that is rotting and decaying and ready to vanish away back into a New Testament system, it's rotting. <clears throat> it's starting to rot. Now, friends, that's why we're trying to tell you, you need, to, you need to get out of the Old Testament. You need to get out of the Old Testament when it comes to your authority for religion. Now, don't call me and say, well, you don't believe in the Old Testament. Yeah, I believe in the Old Testament. I believe it has a purpose just like the Bible says, Romans 15, 4. Things written a four time written for our learning. And I can learn from the Old Testament, but I don't use it for my authority, the justification for why I do what I do. If someone asks me, well, why do y'all have such and such in your worship? Why do you do such and such? I'm not going to go back to the Old Testament to say, because it says here, I'm going to go to the New Testament. I'm going to go to the New Testament. The New Testament says, as far as giving is concerned, it says, 2 Corinthians Chapter 9 and verse 7, here's what the Bible says. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, 
Now that's as, as much as you determined. So let him give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loveth that you're forgiven. Everything that this verse says goes against demanding that people give a 10%. Every man, according to his purpose in his heart, someone comes and tells you you have to give 10%, they've purposed for you. They've determined how much you're going to give, how much you have to give. Nope, not in the Bible, not in the New Testament. you got a rotting religion. And that's why, friends, we're saying you need to get, go, get away from going back to the Old Testament for your authority and go to the New Testament. Going back to the Old Testament is going back to an old system, a decaying system, a rotting system, and it'll only give you rotting religion. Here's what you need to do to obey the gospel, the New Testament. Become a New Testament Christian and have a New Testament authority for why you do what you do. Here, believe the gospel, Acts 15, verse 7. Repent of your sins, Acts 17, verse 30. Paul said, God commanded all men everywhere to repent. You've got to confess Jesus, not, not confess your sins. Nobody wants to hear all the sins you've been doing. If you're fixing to have them washed away, Acts 8, verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest not in all thine heart, if thou, believest in all thine heart thou mayest. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And they come up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now, friends, that, that is New Testament authority for what you must do to be saved. Confess Christ and then be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 22, verse 16. Why tearest thou, arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling the name of the Lord. Now, friends, it doesn't get any clearer than that. This is New Testament. This is the fresh. This is the new this is the, the pure, the perfect. This is the best system. Not the old system. Don't go back to that writing religion. Don't get your authority from the Old Testament. It's decaying. It's ready to uh, vanish away. Appreciate your attention tonight. If you'd like to copy this DVD, all you have to do is write to me. Let me know that you, uh, that you would like some of it. Contact me at workmanlord at gmail.com. Till next time, friends, always remember to ask, what does the Bible say? And you always get a word from the Lord, and you can do your own religious review coming up tonight at 1030 after the news. Have a good night. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting Bible? If you want to find people who...